Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Wolf, and my pronouns are he, him, and they. I'm on the traditional lands of the Swift Water people, also known as the Salish. Thank you for joining us today for Trauma-Informed Practices for Schools. I want to begin with a content warning. Some of the contents of this course may be disturbing or activating, and they are a necessary piece to help provide individualized, trauma-informed, and evidence-based services to children and adults in Ventura County. The information can also be used to better our personal lives. The training has been designed in small bites and includes 10 sections, generally running between 15 and 30 minutes. The training utilizes adult learning methods and we invite you to find a quiet space where you will be undisturbed while sharing this learning space with us. For some of us, this training will touch our personal lived experience. I grew up in Ventura County. I attended Ocean View Junior High School in South Oxnard and Camarillo High School. Post-graduation, I attended university where I was removed when my mother turned me into the school because I was gay. This led to a time where I was unhoused. So I have a direct understanding of the very real struggles of unhoused children and their families. Eventually, I was able to secure employment in the restaurant business as well as housing. When laws changed prohibiting discrimination against queer people, I was hired by the county and worked with thousands of adults and children who faced the very real issues that we're going to cover in this course. Following my career with the county, I became a professional educator and work with five to 10,000 learners annually. I live on an island in Washington State and enjoy a beautiful life. Nevertheless, the traumatic footprint of growing up with a father who was a domestic violence perpetrator and with a mentally ill mother led to an eventual diagnosis of CPTSD after I experienced a mental health crisis. Fortunately, I have a beautiful, supported, chosen family and it has been a struggle to finally find homeostasis and happiness, even joy. I attribute my resiliency to two teachers who took me under their wings and a program called IALAC that was developed for kids like myself through the schools. I say this because you matter. Your work matters. And your choice to spend time in this class can quite literally save lives. I spent two decades in the study of trauma and learning tools regarding how to persevere, what resilience is, and it has been a rigorous journey. I've learned so much. My life is blessed today, and I hope to bring tools to you that will enliven your work and your ability to be present with traumatized and unhoused children and most importantly, with yourself. So let's begin. Thank you for the work that you are doing and thank you for choosing to grow your understanding of trauma-informed practices in schools. All right, welcome. Let's first jump in with learning objectives. Our first learning objective is that we are able to define trauma and describe how it differs from everyday stress. It's really important for us to be able to differentiate between what is stress, what is toxic stress, and what trauma actually is. Secondly, we're gonna learn how to view the behavior of individuals through a trauma lens. We're going to then dive into ACEs, or adverse childhood experiences, and discover what those are and why they are an important waystone for us when we're listening to people so that we can hear their stories through their words. We're gonna learn about resiliency factors, all of these evidence-based tools that were developed by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente so that we could look at what was in support of the people that we are serving. We're going to then move into our development of a better understanding of the role of resilience in buffering the effects of traumatic events. We'll learn the six principles of trauma-informed care. We'll learn about tools that students and clients can use 
when they are experiencing a traumatic stress reaction. We're going to then learn strategies about how to create a trauma-informed school and a workplace. And finally, we'll dive in to understanding vicarious trauma, self-care, how to recognize burnout, and how to manage those things so that during our careers, we can thrive in those situations. We have developed the 10 learning modules and in each module, there's a little apple. The apple is a very specific color that relates to that module. So at the end of that section, you can click on a QR code and go to a Padlet that has vast resources at your disposal that you can utilize if you choose to take your learning to a higher level. We'll review those each time we end a section. First, I want to define trauma. It's really important that we have an accurate and appropriate scientifically based medical definition of trauma and what it is so that we can understand it. Many people are confused about what trauma actually is. So let's take a look at that now. Trauma has four components that must be present to actually have it fit under that title. There are other things that happen. We can have events, we can have toxic stress, there are things that can happen. But when we're talking about trauma, it's important that we understand that it is an umbrella term. It is an umbrella term that is used to describe something that is extremely disturbing. So what are the four components? Let's take a look at that now. First, the event is often sudden or unexpected. I wasn't ready for it. I like to say it happened too fast, too soon, and was too much. So it overwhelmed my ability and capacity to manage that event in a way that would be healthy for me. Secondarily, it creates significant distress. And we're going to talk about this over and over, but it is important at number two for us to understand that this is very personal. What might be distressing to me and what might be distressing to you may be very different. Thirdly, it overwhelms our coping capacity. We don't have the tools in place to manage that event. Again, this is very personal. What may be simple for one person to manage with certain skills may be very challenging for another. And finally, it has the potential to alter the way that I view the world. It literally can change my worldview. And we're going to talk about later in this series what a paradigm is, a belief, a system of beliefs that guides our behavior. And so many of the children that we're working with, part of our jobs is to actually help them form new paradigms. Uh, and so we'll talk about that at length. Trauma is an experience of real or perceived threat. And I want to pause here for a moment. It doesn't have to actually be happening. It can just be perceived. It can be a look someone gives someone where they don't feel safe. And what's really happening with that person is that they have some nebulous thing going on and it had nothing to do with them. So it can be really a perceived threat of bodily injury or death of the person or a loved one. And it causes an overwhelming sense of terror, horror, helplessness, and or fear. What constitutes a traumatic event is in the eye of the beholder, and I cannot stress this enough. So we're going to talk about traumatic invalidation. And this is when a person says, it's not a big deal. Suck it up, buttercup. Let's move on. Get up. Pull up your big girl panties. These things that we say to people that, that, do, that actually create traumatic invalidation for that person in the moment. So it's personal. And I don't have to understand it. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. I don't have to understand what's going on for you to hold compassion in the moment and recognize that you are experiencing something that for you is traumatic. Now we're going to look at different definitions throughout here as we jump into this. And the first person I brought up for you is Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate is a physician and also an author, and he's done extensive work on the downtown east side in Vancouver, Washington, where there is extreme um, 
there are extreme amounts of people who are using drugs and also are unhoused. And what Gabor Mate has found through his studies, and he says there's not one person there that hasn't experienced something so horrible that it brought them to this place. So here's his definition. Gabor Mate says, trauma is a psychic wound that hardens one psychologically and then interferes with your ability to grow and develop. It pains you and now you're acting out of pain. It induces fear and now you're acting out of fear. Trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what's happened to you. Trauma is that scarring that makes you less flexible, more rigid, less feeling, and more defended. Gabor Mate's book is In the Land of Hungry Ghosts. If you haven't read that, it's a fabulous resource. And I invite you to take that on if you want to take your learning to the next level. Now let's talk about different types of trauma. So people often talk about trauma like it's one thing and it's very and very complex and so individual. We're going to touch on a few things. We're thinking about acute, chronic and complex trauma. So acute trauma, trauma that may result from a single accident or an incident. We know that in the example used here is a car crash. Chronic trauma. Trauma that is repeated and continues to happen over a long period of time. And I would venture to say, and I think safely, that most of the children in foster care have experienced both acute and chronic ongoing trauma. And then finally, complex trauma. It means that this individual has exposure to multiple traumatic events. And they come from different places. So we think about PTSD and then we think about CPTSD. CPTSD is a diagnosis that introduces us to the idea of the complexity of trauma where it's come from multiple sources. The child may have a parent who is using uh, alcohol or drugs. The child may have a parent who is a DV perpetrator. The child may have mental illness in their household. The child may be suffering from physical or emotional neglect. All of those things compound and layer on top of each other to create an intersection that is very complex. And it's our, our job to recognize when complex trauma is in front of us and not try to just whittle it down to a simple one definition of what that thing is for everyone. It's extremely personal. I can't stress that enough. We've also got racial trauma. And as we watch what unfolds in our country in real time in front of us, we see issues of racism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, ageism, ableism, all of these kinds of things. But what's important for us to understand is that racial trauma is a very specific thing that impacts black indigenous people of color. And it refers to the stressful pain of one's experience with racism, and discrimination. Historical trauma, multi-generational trauma experienced by a specific culture, racial, or ethnic group. So we know that historical trauma has happened in large part in the Jewish community. We also know in the African-American community, in Asian communities, etc., etc. And so it's important for us to also understand those historical components and know our history around those events. When we think about Japanese internment camps in this country, that is a perfect example of historical trauma that is carried forward into generations and impacts those generations going forward. Community trauma, exposure to intentional acts of interpersonal violence committed in public areas by people who are not related to the victim. The saddest example of this, is, when I think about this in real time that is impacting you, and a perfect example of this is school shootings. That is community trauma. It impacts not just the people involved and the horror that they experience, but the entirety of the community around us. Then we think about natural disasters and trauma. So earthquakes, wildfires, tornadoes, tsunamis, floods, extreme weather. And we think about the loss of life or displacement, loss of home, personal property, a necessity to change schools, loss of community support, even death of loved ones, personal injury, economic hardships. 
There's resources on each slide where you can actually go and read more about these each one of these as they pull out as separate entities and I invite you to do that as we go through the course. What are the six principles of trauma-informed practices? The first place we're going to go is safety. That students and staff are made to feel physically and emotionally safe and how do we do this in a world where schools are, are experiencing violence and shootings, it becomes really incredibly challenging. And it really comes down to more than just putting up bulletproof glass. It comes up to us creating environments where people can show up to work and feel safe and cared for. Trustworthiness and transparency that decisions are made that are transparent, which allows students to build relationships and feel that they can trust school staff and supportive adults. Peer support. Students have access to individuals with shared lived experience who can understand and relate to them and respond to their concerns and their needs. Collaboration, communication among staff and the students that's ongoing and supports the shared decision making to balance out power differences. Empowerment. Student and staff voices, opinions, and suggestions are heard and validated so that students feel like their voice matters. Now, this seems like it may be a lot. This is a lot for us to think about. But what this really comes down to is our ability to have empathy in a moment. I can have empathy and it can be absent understanding. I can come to you and hold space with you and try to tend to what your needs are in the moment, even if I don't know your whole story. And that's really the gift in this. Finally, cultural, historical, and gender issues. Staff must be intentional about addressing and responding to the negative impacts of biases, stereotypes, and historical trauma. Before that, creating classrooms and environments where children are loved and supported and that they can bring their whole selves to school. And that also includes the teachers. We want to create inclusive environments where people can bring their culture, their history, their beautiful self, and be 100% who they are. And this we know, statistically, enhances learning for everyone. So we've come to the end of our first segment. And as I shared with you initially, we've created for you a Padlet link. Padlet is a wonderful tool. If you haven't used it, I invite you to hold your phone up to this QR code that we have here, and it will send a little message to you that says, do you want to go to this link? And you just click on it and you'll be there in a minute. I invite you to look at it on a laptop or a larger computer. There's a lot there to look at. For each segment, as we go along, we will be offering you a color-coded pattern for where you might look. So I invite you for this first segment to just go take a look at the Padlet. Just take a few minutes to browse around and see the resources. Our next segment is going to be about ACEs or adverse childhood experience and symptoms of trauma. And the resource color for that is green. So if you go to the Padlet, all of the, the resources that are highlighted in green would be appropriate for our next session. I want to point out two resources for you as well. Foster Youth Services Coordinating Program. We have their email and also their phone number on the screen for you. And then the Homeless Education Program, which also has a phone number and an email address if you have questions. I look forward to our next segment, which is going to be Trauma-Informed Practices for Schools. We are going to jump right into ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences and Symptoms, and learn more about what it is that we're seeing behaviorally in children that can point us to solutions that will benefit us all. Thank you for your time in this segment. I look forward to seeing you in part two. Take care.